everybody. Uh, the six days left before the election, and I wanted to uh, welcome everybody to the Big Tent and welcome to our last Spotlight Wednesday before Election Day. Um, the Big Tent co-chairs and I have enjoyed these Wednesdays with you and are so grateful for your amazing support of Big Ten. We have come a very long way in the past four months, and we look forward to introducing you to more incredible speakers and opportunities in the future. Um, so, but thank you all for being here tonight. I know it's crazy. Um, there's a lot of things going on, um, and we have a lot of work still to do in the next six days. So um, I hope we'll be uh, celebrating in a week, um, but until then, we gotta keep going. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. Um, Belinda Badcock will be our moderator for the call. Following our speaker's presentation, our moderator will follow up with some questions of her own, and then we will open it up for Q&A from everyone on the call. Please put your questions in the chat and we will ask you to unmute and you can ask the questions directly to the speaker. So without further ado, I am pleased to have my very good friend, Joey Magliocco, introduce our terrific speaker tonight. Okay, thanks, Susan. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, before I introduce her, I just want to send a big thank you to Juliet. She's busier than anybody I know out there advising everybody on CNN as soon as something happens. She's right there um, teaching at Harvard, and she was kind enough to fit us in tonight um, and help us and, and talk us through what's going on and what potentially may happen um, next week. So, in addition to all the many hats she's wearing, as I said, her main um, focus right now has been advising mayors and governors about next week and what to expect. And so now I'd like to turn everything over to Juliet and she's gonna take us through uh, sort of national safety in the time of yeah. a crazy election. So thank you, Juliet. Thanks, Joey. And thanks everyone. This is such a great group. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, and if we have any glitches, I told everyone in the house to get off because I didn't want any glitches. Um, I'll get back right uh, right back on. Um, Joey and I have known each other forever. I think my sister may be hiding somewhere with my mother in one of the panels uh, through my sister Marisa and my mom. I'm going to shout out to them. Uh, they don't join uh, any events, if not ma not many. So I'm glad that they're on. Um, so and and thank you for all you're doing. I really I, I really mean that. I did a little bit of research on uh, your commitment, your enthusiasm, your support, your uh, your bandwidth, your sweat equity, everything matters. Um, and so I'm sort of on the other end of that, which is um, I, you know, I clearly have a candidate, uh, uh, Biden, and um, uh, but I also uh, uh, we have a nation to protect and and to protect the right to vote. So I do a lot of uh, consulting and work in both the private and the public space. I've been spent a lot of time on COVID uh, up until about uh, the end of the summer. Uh, when um, it became clear, uh, tensions were high, uh, the polling was a little bit closer. Uh, remember we were talking about like 272, 268 uh, in terms of electoral votes. Um, and, uh, and a lot of mayors and governors started to position themselves to think about what uh, the lead up to November 3rd would be like, and then of course after. So I just thought I would start off, uh, uh, Susan, Belinda, and Joey and I sort of, I would start off and just tell you the briefing I'm giving them. It's as good as any in terms of what they're anticipating or what we should be anticipating um, uh, positioning. And then I assume this is off the record and sort of what my gut is telling me right now um, in terms of uh, what to anticipate. So my stress level is um, what I say, uh, DEF CON four-ish, uh, but remember one is the worst. Everyone thinks five is the worst, one is the worst. It's four-ish, there's an elevated threat, there's a president who's you know, gonna burn things on his way out, but, um, but um, there's also a lot of mechanisms to stop that from happening. So it's probably worth sharing with all of you. So you can focus on what needs to be done, which is you know, voting and getting people out. Um, okay, so I'm gonna do the first slide. I'm gonna go through three slides quickly because I think we have a tendency to view election interference as sort of one big thing. And I think it's actually um, not that. So I'll wait for that first slide just to divide it up for you mentally so you can know sort of um, what we're doing. And um, um, okay, so next one, I'll just, as this is the election threats. Okay, so we divide this into 
It's my little wonky slides, but why not be wonky tonight? Okay, so there, so so let's not forget the foreign threat. We sort of forget it because we're so worried about the domestic threat. Uh, there is a concerted effort on a foreign uh, campaign against the elections. It's very similar to 2016 with some variations. Russia continues to be the number one threat. Whatever you hear from the White House or from uh, Radcliffe, who's the uh, head of the Office of um, uh, director of national intelligence, um, uh, both uh, Director Ray of the FBI and also DHS have consistently said it's Russia. And you need to really mentally divide that into two different pieces. So one is just your disinformation, right? That's the Facebook stuff, the, the you know, the, the one of the number one circulated Facebook news stories in 2016 targeted to air, Catholic areas in Pennsylvania was that the Pope had endorsed Trump. Um, and so, you know, it's just that sort of, you know, picking up on divisions in our society, the racial conflicts, the um, uh, political conflicts, and that's ongoing. And, you know, China is part of that and it involves the anti-vaccination campaign. It's just sort of messing with our head. The other is true disruption. What is going on in that sense? So what we know now, at least publicly, and, and what certainly was true, when I was still in government is uh, the Russians and others, you know, are, are trying to get entry into critical infrastructure, including voting infrastructure. They, they have in some instances, there's no evidence or proof of, of, of changing votes from Trump to Biden or Biden to Trump. Um, they can get into networks, but not have the capacity to change them. Because once you change them, you really do expose yourself. So they're probably just looking. Um, this is a form of disruption because it makes you think that the threat is greater than it is, right? So it's like an ant, it, you know, in your head, you're like convinced every vote is going to go for Trump. Uh, there's just no evidence of that now. And people both in and out of government uh, uh, are pretty confident in that. In this way, our really crazy voting system actually may be our savior. It's very hard to have significant impact um, in terms of changing votes, just because of the distributive nature of our elect election system. There are 3,000 different election uh, systems that are going to be in play on November 3rd from state, county, city, local, regional, yeah, all of that. Every state has a different place. So just that's, it's hard to disrupt that. Um, but the kind of disruption that I'm mostly worried about is actually not the election disruption per se directly, right, we're going to go in. It's what has come to be understood as um, uh, 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 voting infrastructure disruption. In other words, can you make it harder for people to get out the vote because you disrupt other critical infrastructure? So imagine if you want Michigan to go to um, uh, Trump, if you're Russia. Uh, so you want to um, you want to suppress 10,000 African American votes in Detroit. That might do it, or it might help. So you, um, you 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 get control of the verse 911 system, and you say there's an active shooter, right, who's killed 30 people, or you you uh, you bring down the signals um, in areas of Detroit. So there's a lot of focus on this by mayors and governors. That kind of critical infrastructure disruption, and trust me. There are a couple thousand lawyers all lined up on November 3rd, ready to file motions for extension, motions to you know keep hours up and all that stuff. So, okay, so that's your foreign threat. You think that's bad enough. Now we have three different kinds of sort of what you might call internal domestic threats. So one is just what you're reading in the newspapers, which I view as a form of voter suppression, but it's through legal mechanisms. It's the courts. And you know, the courts are going back and forth, and North Carolina does this, and then the Supreme Court does that. You can call it lawful, I put it in quotes, but you know, there's a there's an entire legal apparatus supporting a vote suppression. And there's just no other way to look at it in terms of, you know, if someone votes before no November 3rd, but their ballot comes in November 4th at 2 a.m., that's not changing the election results. That's actually part of the election results. So there's going to be a lot of litigation. The Supreme Court is somewhat all over the place. There was a loss two days ago with Wisconsin. There was a victory today um, uh, uh, that the new Supreme Court justice recused herself from. So we don't know what to expect, but we don't want that to happen. But the, so, so there's that voter suppression. Once again, a couple thousand lawyers ready to jump on counting and how you do it. I should say uh, states like North, the big swing states, almost all of them have state Democratic AGs and Democratic sec secretaries of state. I only say that because obviously the fight is over expansion, not expansion of the, um, of the uh, mail-in 
or absentee ballots, which tend to go in favor of Democrats, although there is some questions about that. Okay, the second is COVID, which we like shouldn't forget. And there is actually litigation going on right now, like right now, as we speak, I just looked at it right before in Mich I think it's Michigan, one of the states, the, no, it's not Michigan, it's a, the Attorney General um, doesn't wants to waive the governor's masking rules when voting so that more people will come vote. But that's not it's going to undermine confidence. Um, my view on this has changed significantly since March, since we now know uh, what the what the virus is like. In March, I was one of those people saying we have to find better mechanisms for for voting because we'll be we'll likely be in the middle of a pandemic. We didn't know it would be this bad. Um, uh, but now what now we know more if I tell people if you go to the market, you can go vote right in other words, if you go to the market masked and are doing the social distancing and staying away from people, you can vote if you're if you have a precondition or other things that are keeping you from going outside don't don't go vote unless you have to unless you have no other options. Okay, and then the third is the one that we're starting to pick up on now, which is, of course, the sort of vigilante intimidation and violence right the sort of the the, the radicalization that's coming from mostly the right, there's some activity on the left, but not even the FBI views that as, as, as organized. That is um, going to be, that is about um, uh, uh, intimidating people so that they don't vote, terrifying them so that it's just an experience you don't wanna be a part of, um, or taking advantage of the, the uh, a not a settled deal, deal on November 3rd, and the radicalization sort of breeds in the, in the um, in the vagueness, right? And so, and then of course, Donald Trump, who uses forms, you know, who uses his pulpit to radicalize without actually saying it, right? He he hints and he you know talks about his you know uh, uh, this governor is bad and that governor is horrible and Biden is Biden will get shot. You know, he said that yesterday. It, it doesn't really matter what he says; it's what you know a very small percentage of his followers are saying that we worry about. So it's a form of terrorism in some ways, but he sort of has plausible deniability. I have no doubt that is part of the post November 3rd um, strategy uh, if it comes to that. So this is what mayors and governors have been preparing for. So nothing's shocking. It's just a good way to, to think through sort of how would you uh, prepare for that. So what's about to happen? It's already happening. You're hearing about Texas, Washington, Pennsylvania. We've got four states now and one, the fourth one, um, uh, have already uh, deployed their National Guard in anticipation of, of essentially right-wing violence on November 3rd. So next slide. I'll keep talking if, I'll go to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is under intimidation and violence. So basically what you're gonna start to see, you've already started to see it. If um, um, I know this is a national group, so some of you will start to hear. So this is part of why I, I brief people not in public safety or public officials is so that you're not surprised so that the deployment of National Guard or the command center that's that the NYP, the NYPD has a command center. They're gonna activate it. There's no question about it. Um, it's not panic, it is just preparedness. So you're going to see a lot of communication about how this unfolds in terms of um, deploying um, uh, public safety assets to protect the right to vote, should intelligence uh, lead to that. Um, engagement with communities that do not view public safety, um, like many of us may, as sort of you know beneficial. But as we're seeing in Philadelphia, there is there is um, uh, uh, you know a, another police misconduct case. The Democratic governor in that state has already deployed the National Guard because Pennsylvania is a swing state. It's just going to be a huge state. You want to try to protect law and order or at least some stability the best you can. There's going to be a lot more surveillance of public sites. Uh, that's good. That's how actually it was a public website that got the investigation against uh, uh, regarding Governor Whitmer in Michigan started. And then there were FBI informants. I suspect there are lots of cases. I wouldn't know about them now uh, going on, but a lot more focus on what are these guys saying? Where are they congregating? Congregating? Can we meet them there? And certainly, can we separate them from um uh, from peaceful uh, uh, voters, which the answer is generally yes, that you can, uh, as a form of crowd control, uh, protect voters. The crazy thing is, is as you, many of you know, we do not have a federal 
uh, uh, um, ban on weapons in voting facilities. It's just crazy. So open carry states allow open carry in voting booths, which is like, you're like, there's, there's one place you don't need one, it's there. Um, you've seen a lot more planning over the last couple months, including um, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the integration of military assets. Should need be, we've, lots of people have suspicion about Governor Abbott and This may be the time where she's on hold for a moment. Um, so until uh, Juliet comes back, um, please put in your questions. Um, so when she comes back, we can um, really start the questions and Belinda can go through them if that works. There's a lot of questions that we have. I can say that um, I've been doing um, uh, some work in Pennsylvania and the voter uh, barrier to entry continues to be really you know, terrible. It's uh, many people have voted, they haven't received their ballots, they haven't received their applications. Um, if they don't get it, then they have to kind of do all these different things. So it's, it's really crazy, um, particularly in Pennsylvania of all the places that, that we have. Um, Susan, are, are you seeing actual in intimidation? Are you seeing People they haven't, they haven't said, so I'm on the hotline, so they don't talk about intimidation, but they do talk about, um, they, uh, a husband and wife put their ballots in together, you know, separate ballots, but together into a ballot box and the husband's comes back, it's checked off, it's recorded and the, and the wife's isn't. It's same, same time, same box, same date. And if the wife's doesn't come in, then she may have to go in person and then they're going to see that she had already has a, uh, a ballot that she received. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's crazy. Um, oh, Juliet, I think is back. I think. Juliet, are you on? Can't see her. There she is. Oh, there she is, good. Juliet, are you here? Hold on now. You should take a sec, yes. And if I'm not mistaken, Susan. I'm here. There she oh, good. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I'm going to do it by phone. My son said that it just dropped um, in the house. There's a big rainstorm here. So um, I, I'm, a, I'm a planner, so I have my backup systems. I had you in my phone. Is this OK? Not ideal, but it's great. Thank you so much. Oh, no worries. No worries. You're going to see my son. He's bringing me the phone charger. Um, so my mom will be happy. Um, so, uh, so um, I was, I think you, I left you with disclosure. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So basically I wish that more public safety agencies would disclose these plans so that they don't like sort of come out of the blue and shock everyone. But uh, the, the nature of public safety is just that they tend to be more quiet than they need to be. And that's just the, the nature of things. So um so that's sort of where we are. Um, and next slide. Okay. Um, I can't believe Cal uh, Connecticut is an open carry state. Can you just plug it in here? Um, okay. So then the big worry is uh, plans after November 3rd. So I want to tell you all yeah, I want to tell you all that um, I am actually getting more and more convinced this gets settled on November 3rd. I have a lot of, uh, I just think that the metrics that we're starting to see now are showing a, a remarkable uh, re, uh, resiliency by the Biden campaign to keep up these numbers at this stage. Now, I don't know if I'm right. I'm not a political person in that sense. Certainly from a public safety capacity, this is the, this is what we want, right? We want uh, uh, it's settled on November 3rd because the radicalization that will be played by the White House will breed itself as they, I don't think they're going to um, win the election through force. What they want to do is create enough tension in that period uh, that, uh, that the sense of urgency 
is stronger than it needs to be, right? And then there's a rush through the courts. And then but D Donald Trump said today, essentially that, you know, their hope is, you know, that they get it into, it's so close, they get it into the courts. Um, so we're asking lots of public safety officials to, you know, be, and you're seeing this, like, even if you're on Twitter, um, on your on your Twitter today, you would have seen lots of um, um, uh, things in your feed. Twitter is doing a huge campaign um, around uh, uh, let's wait on the vote, wait for the count, wait for the count. That's sort of the, the logo. Communicating with people who uh, are in positions of power. Central areas of disruption, in particular, I think, courthouses. I think that's what you're going to start to see. Um, and so that's sort of what we're plan what we're seeing at this stage. I want to address something that I saw in the chat room and at the um, uh, which is, of course, um, the um, worry about Donald Trump's use of federal assets to curb certain activity. OK, so here's what I know and here's what I don't know. Um, here's what I know. He does not have the military anymore. He knows that. After Lafayette, you saw Miley, Esper, and every, uh, head, Miley being the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Esper being the Secretary of Defense, and every head of the services essentially pushed back. I'm not going to forgive Miley for what happened in Lafayette, but that was a real breakdown of 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 military command. And if you don't even have to read, read the tea leaves, they've been quite explicit. I think Trump knows that. And that's why Trump has turned to DHS, my old agency, uh, to, to wreak havoc in some cities with unmarked, you know, what are they, um, un, unidentified federal assets. I will say DHS has even been more muted lately. I think, um, I think if the numbers are overwhelming, which is what we want, which is what you're working on, um, it, it'd be, it, it'll be almost impossible to imagine a scenario in which something is viewed as unruly. Now that could change if we still don't know by the end of November. Uh, but certainly if I'm, if I'm, you know, talk to me again, November 10th, that's when, you know, you, we'll, we can give this a week. Um, so that's why, um, so that's sort of what we're, Looking at Bill Barr has been very quiet the last week. Those of you who follow conspiracy theories may wonder why. Uh, people on the left are worried he's planning a war. People like me are convinced he had COVID and they're hiding it from us. I don't know. He has not been seen publicly in over a week. Um, and so uh, we'll figure out what that's about eventually. So that's sort of what we're anticipating. But once again, I was a lot more nervous two months ago about the gray areas. That's what people like me don't like. You know, like so certainty, you know, in planning is that we like that. Um, uh, uh, and it seems very possible, although, you know, I still have PTSD from 2016 and I don't want to jinx it. It seems much more likely uh, that, um, that, that, that there'll be a sufficient enough victory. In other words, Trump loses Pennsylvania Texas can't be called, Biden wins Michigan and Wisconsin, that even, um, and there's a lot of people working on Fox News for this, that even uh, uh, Republican strongholds will, will, will have to admit there's no path for Trump. So that's sort of what we're looking at. So once again, I'm still smiling. I just need everyone to go out and vote. And that's, and I'll turn it back to you. Well, thank you, Juliet, um, and thanks for sharing all that uh, incredible insight into this um, sort of hidden world for us. And yeah, um, I, I was going to say that I, I wonder how you sleep at night, but being the way you ended um, with a smile, uh, I'm thinking that uh, perhaps you're sleeping a little better these days. Yes. Um, and I'm going to open it up to the chat box in just a moment. And I'll, I'll chat box, but I'll, I'll call on people to ask you the questions. But you touched slightly on the on the um, local, the domestic unrest. Yes. And you touched on militias. They're increasing in the number around the country. And right. is there anything that you feel we could do to limit their power or their threats? I mean, is there anything tangible that uh, can be done? I, th I mean, I think that some of the some of it will come through po politics, you know, whether gun control laws and more investigations, you know, it's really hard to uh, bifurcate. I mean, this is what worries me most about uh, a second, a lot worries me about a Trump second term, but uh, but it is remarkable how a lot of the system did still hold. So you're still seeing a lot of FBI disruptions of these guys. You're still seeing a lot of um, cases and investigations and surveillance. I don't know if that holds um, in terms of the militia white supremacy uh, groups. 
So, um, but I, I think we can't underestimate um, how turning Trump into the Wizard of Oz will have an impact. I, I study a lot on terrorism. That's the field I, I initially started and I'm now more in what I call Homeland Security, which is, you know, deals with all threats. But um, the rise of white supremacy and the white supremacist groups, which we started to see in Obama, the people, you know, because we had an African-American president, is really due to three concurrent things um, uh, of which the third will be will put an end to, right? So the, the first is, you know, sometime in 20, 2014 or 2013, I don't know how many people are aware of this, it was the first year that non-white uh, citizen babies were born in the US, exceeded, were, were greater, larger number than white. So we are now in that trajectory in which the United States probably by 2046, 2047, we will be a majority non-white nation. Now for most of us, that is just the normal course of integration and, and inter, interracial marriages and interfaith marriages. Uh, but it's, you know, it, it is viewed as a displacement to the to a, to a section of the white population. And so there, this, this form of white supremacy, which has gotten more radicalized lately, um, it is uh, what we call the displacement theory, which is they really do view as the pie is limited. So the African-American couple that moves in next door to them, it's not just, oh, I don't like them. It is literally their presence um, is a threat to me. That, then the second thing is, of course, the, the social media. And, um, and 4chan and 8chan, Facebook is trying to get better. Twitter is really should be commended. It's brought down a lot of this crap. Um, Facebook, a little bit less so, but is trying. Um, and so, uh, so you have that so that you, you have a group of men who are organizing so that there's no lone wolves. It's just wrong to think of them as lone wolves. They've just, they've got a community. And then the third, um, the third piece is the one that will go away if Trump loses, which is um, what I call um, uh, uh, there's no shaming, right? In other words, he does not shame them. There's, there's in, in the past, every president, even if they slightly winked a nod to them, um, would never not shame them, right? So the president embraces them. Even yesterday, folks, like he, he said about the people who were trying to kill Governor Whitmer, he said, well, they, you know, they may have a point, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's um, not shaming it. And I think that if you have a president like Biden, it may ratchet up in the first year and during the transition because, you know, the last calling, but, um, but uh, it won't, it won't have, um, uh, it won't have a sense of placement in our society. So just like Nazism did not die in World War II um, or, or with the war, racism didn't die with, with civil rights legislation. They, they also, they, they wither because they get shamed that to be part of society. So that's, that's what I'm looking at. And that's a key factor in what we're seeing now. So you just, if you get rid of the amplifier, Trump, um, you, may, you, you may minimize a lot of the problem. Yeah, good point, good point. Um, I'll hand it over to Jill, um, who has a question for you, Jill. Okay, great. Hi, Julia. Hi. Um, is there anything that we as citizens can do to help combat like the yeah. disinformation that's, that's coming out and like either now or even in the future, is there some yeah. kind of a role that we can play? Yeah, so there is. I mean, first of all, is just to be uh, civically engaged, to be careful what you're reading, what you're uh, amplifying. I mean, you, I even sometimes, I have a lot of Twitter followers. That's my platform. I sometimes make mistakes. I realize I'm saying something or retweeting someone. So part of it is just to educate ourselves on sort of what we're consuming and then our children and our communities. Um, I think that there's a role to push back on it too. I think that uh, Hillary Clinton probably learned the hard way. People do believe in the silence. And so I do think that ways that we can combat misinformation, say about vaccination or about uh, Biden's son, you know, the whole QAnon thing, which I'm sure a lot of you probably are experiencing in your communities. It's, 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 it's breathtaking what QAnon has managed to do um, uh, to, to combat it at, at its source. In other words, you know, whether it's online or in, uh, in communities. I think, um, you know, I think we can't know um, I guess the third thing is, uh, you know, use your purchasing power to make a statement. I mean, I think that, uh, uh, you know, f f uh, 
a lot of corporations abandoned Fox News for that reason. It's a it's a um, a movement called Sleeping Giants, I think it is, right? Where where they basically just say, look, we believe in um, in in different thoughts, and people can debate policies, but you know, you put a you you put a you have a host who's promoting white supremacy, we're not going to advertise on your network. Um, and so, which is what we've seen with at least some of the primetime lineup on Fox. So I think use your purchasing power too, uh, to make statements of good corporate conduct and bad corporate conduct. So like, I'm not flying right now. That's a personal choice. It just, there's, I'm, one is I'm not being invited anywhere anymore. Everything as you see is by Zoom or, or try Zoom, at least on my phone. But um um, uh, you know, Delta, I'm like in love with now. I used to hate Delta, but Delta has thrown 150 people on a no-fly list um, because they fake their way onto an airplane uh, with a mask because you can't get onto an airplane without, without a mask now. Um, and then they whip them off and claim that they have some new disease or freedom or whatever. And I, I you know, I love that, that sort of uh, agency that institutions are starting to assert against just really dangerous and, and, and harmful behavior. And you mentioned uh, Fox News, one of our, um, one of our speakers uh, a couple of weeks ago, Media Matters or American Bridge, they're related yeah. organizations. They have a great program called Unfox Your Box. Um, yeah. A way to show Fox News that, um, you know, you keep uh, talking um, uh, smack for other lack of a better word. Um, we're, we're, you know, we're going to we're going to drop you as a uh, we're going to drop you as users. Sponsor, right. That, that's exactly well, what Spotify. Spotify is dealing with this right now. I don't know if you've heard Joe Rogan is, is one of their uh, new podcasts. I think they paid, what, $100 million for him over 10 years. I had never heard of him before. Um, he just had. Um, uh, Alex Jones on, who was, Alex Jones was uh, doing an anti-vaccination tirade. And I think it's ridiculous that Spotify and a, a number of us got on our platforms and just said, you know, this is, this is, this is killing people. This is not like, you know, Biden, you know, it's not even, I mean, however crude is, you know, someone makes fun of Biden's stutter. That's not like physically harmful. If someone who has a hundred million listeners or 20 million listeners, however many he has, um, is promoting anti-vax, I think it's safe to say that's like fire in a theater. Yeah, irresponsible, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna hand it over to Michael. Michael, please go ahead. Great. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, thank you. My question is, uh, because our election system is so disjointed kind of on uh, what you touched upon, um, what changes can be made in a potential Biden administration to yeah. safeguard future elections that might be hopefully closer than this one will be um, yeah. and get rid of those kind of gray area um, areas that you were talking about? Well, I think, I mean, let's not forget for, for this being the first aggressive year, on um, mail-in voting, right? It really, I mean, do, does anyone, I mean, besides out of state, most of you probably have never voted mail-in and my guess is, you know, close to 70 or 80% of you have already voted. It's funny, I even say voted in past tense as if it's, you know, I mean, like as most people I know have already voted. So one is we're just learning a lot about capacity and about communication. I think, uh, you know, you won't have the, you won't have the US, the, 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 um, uh, the attack on USPS under a Biden administration, you could have prioritization of, of voting mail over everything else. So you would literally just have a system of mail sorting that would prioritize the size of the mail and, and get it moving. I think we could, probably could have been better. Honestly, I know a lot of people are freaking out about the US Postal Service saying, get it in the mail a week before, otherwise it can't be guaranteed. The truth is if I told you a piece of mail, a personal piece of mail had to absolutely arrive within a week, you would probably FedEx it, right? I mean, in other words, I mean, a week is about as long as you would think it would take. So I'm not too freaked out about that. And I don't mind if people have to uh, walk. So I think where the big changes is, so, so then there's, I think there could be federal legislation around, um, giving the right to vote to uh, federal um, uh, 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 um, uh, people who had had federal crimes. So you, 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 give, you in, enfranchise those who have been disenfranchised uh, by federal crimes that you could do from the 
find them perch. You could put resources. You could put lots of money into modernizing our systems. States and localities don't have a lot of money for this. So you could do things like that. But I think the real fight and why everyone's saying up and down the ballot, up and down the ballot is, of course, going to be in in um, um uh, in the states. It's going to be uh, what kind of rules are s set up by the states. Who's your secretary of state? I mean that honestly. Like, And and it's not Republican, Democrat. Like, I don't know if anyone's from West Virginia here. Republican um, uh, secretary of state. One of the most sort of, you know, um, pro-access secretaries of state out there. That's why, you know, they believe in the right to vote. So I do think it's going to be maybe getting people in a position in those positions who can put the resources and the focus in. But for all of the problems that you're hearing, if you just look at the numbers and that the system is holding still, right? I mean, what, as of today, is this right? As of today, in most states, I may be making this up a little, but I'm not making it up, but I don't want to misremember. But in many states, more people have voted in mail-in ballots um, today than all of the voting on that election day in 2016, right? So you're just, this is maximum capacity. And so the system is, still seems to be holding up and we're going to have fights over what, what arrives on, on November 4th. We have a question now from Sherry Ramsey. Sherry, please Great. go. Oh boy. Okay. I'm so excited. Thank you for taking time out to do this on a huge Of course. Um, while you were cut out, there was a woman who raised the um, something going on in Pennsylvania, which is my home state yeah. now in Connecticut, but um, about like that a man and a woman dropped their votes off in the absentee ballot box uh, and the man's was already counted, but the woman was trying to check hers and there's no record of it. I mean, how, yeah. how, like, how do you speak to the scariness of that in a swing, yeah. state, very important swing state? And right. So, other, but I'll do it no, 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 I think that's great. And actually I see my internet is on. You can probably see the back of my head, but maybe we won't risk it, but um, so I don't lose you again, if you don't all mind my, me on my phone, but um, uh, the storm has gone away. Uh, okay, so there's going to be, a, so, so an anecdote doesn't make a crisis. So, so part of it is, um, it, did she forget to sign her envelope so that now it's in the non-compliance pile? So I would recommend to her, whatever we're hearing, you, know, you, you need to unfortunately go, go to your voting place and see if it's been placed in the non-compliance. Because one of the things, so one of the bargains, so don't view it as a disenfranchise, one of the bargains for allowing mail-in voting was that you had to have security features and you're talking to a security person. So the double, the signature thing, stuff like that, those weren't dis disenfranchisement mechanisms. Those were intended to be mechanisms for enfranchisement, right? In other words, now I'm giving you an option, but I have to verify your signature, make sure you're not signing for a dead ant, you know, stuff like that. Just so I, that's my, my, my suspicion is there was something wrong with that she did with her ballot and that there's not, nefarious but you're going to hear nefarious things you're going to look there's going to be pockets of violence or pockets of a uh, supposed violence my network which i adore you know is going to have every you know you know every corner where there's 20 you know screaming trump supporters you know yelling explosives at you know biden voters as like a you know that the system is coming down i want you to remember it's a big country, none of, you know, th those, those are, we're still on the anecdotal phase. And that makes me happy because that can be managed. Uh, so that's what I'm guessing is happening. So, so these rules around voting and, and mail-in voting, um, they may seem really onerous and you may worry people are being disenfranchised. They were really a bargain to allow for the kind of voting that we're having, which I think is the wave of the future. And we will do what NPR has now urged us all to do if you listen to them, which is stop calling it election day. We call it election season now. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Um, Lindy, Lind Lindy Linian, Linian, sorry. Please go ahead. Is she there? Lindy? Okay. Um, Hello. Oh, there we go. Oh, there she is. Okay. Sorry about that. I had just put in the chat. I'm wondering all this preparation you were talking about. Yeah. Um, how much of that happens regularly with elections, or is it all new? 
is all pretty new. It's pretty shocking. I mean, I, I um, did a big write up about what was going on. And I, you know, <laughs> when you live in the world of, you know, everyone sort of hates, not hates it, but like, you know, being a, I would describe myself as like a socially liberal Democrat, but a moderate Democrat on safety issues. And like, I don't mind surveillance, you know, and I don't, so, you know, I sort of got stopped being outraged like three years ago. I just knew I would like age too much and, and it would not be good. So I don't, I try not to get outraged. I need to have my moments like everyone else. And so to me, it's just sort of, okay, here's a problem how do you try to solve it or minimize the risk, right? So, you know, yes, I'm outraged about the COVID response. I'm outraged that it's come to this. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people, my worry is that um, opponents of Trump will get so upset by this or be so enraged by the fear of violence or the fact that we are, you know, having public safety agencies go out that they will amplify it in a way that it doesn't need to be. And that to me is, would be the biggest harm, right? So, so I'm urging allies just, you know, you know, six more days, you know, pace the rage, bring the temperature down because they want our attention. It's just like disinformation, right? They want you to engage. And, um, and so I just don't want to give that to them the next six days, but you are exactly right. You know, in my moments, of, I do have moments of, I can't believe the hell that I'm doing this, you know, that I just did a briefing yesterday with 200 mayors across the U.S., Republican, Democrat, just to sort of, you know, lay out, you know, what should they be doing Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And um, uh, yeah, I have my moments of, I can't believe this is America, but, you know, let's just get through Tuesday and then we're going to have a horrible transition with this guy. And then, and then hopefully um, if there's a victory for Biden, uh, uh, you know, we, we get things back in order. Yeah. Um, it sounds odd to say, but this is United States. This is really yeah. um, unbelievable. But yeah. Emily, Emily, one of the co-hosts, please go ahead. Oh, great. Oh, um, thank you, Julia, for thank being you. here with us. Um, just curious which you view as, I'm sorry, Joey and I are in the same room, so I've okay. got a little feedback. But um, do you view white nationalism really as a bigger threat than foreign interference yes. now? Um, oh, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, that's a great, so it's just such a different threat and the response mechanisms are so different that I don't know if I can Juliet, you're, hear you're muted. Uh, I don't know. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so they're so different in both sort of who's instigating them um, as well as what our response should be that I'm not sure I compare them. Um, I do think that um, the foreign interference uh, is being better managed than it was in 2016. I think we're just so much smarter. And I think whatever you think of Chris Ray or or you know the, the 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 intelligence community, the law enforcement community really do have their eyes on this now. And remember, they just didn't. I remember in 2016 hearing the Hillary Clinton, and I'm in this space hearing the Hillary Clinton campaign, you know, talk about you know you know interactions between Trump's campaign and Russia, and sort of thinking, oh, they're kind of you know that can't possibly be right. So um, I think that we're um, that it's much better off um, in terms of what our response is, um, um, and where I and it's more predictable. So, like we kind of know what they're trying to do, and so we're looking for it. The thing that worries me about white nationalism is, of course, it's not predictable. We don't know. It's getting energized by some of the language that we're starting to see from Trump in just the most recent days. I mean, you know, people are like, "Well, his closing argument is, you know." Biden's son. I said, no, I think his closing argument is the burn the house down. That's what I'm a little bit worried about. Um, and certainly if he loses decisively, you know, there's one school of thought that he will resign, try to get pardoned by Pence, at least of the federal crimes. And then he may be one of the first American presidents who does not retire in the United States just because he has so much liability, exposure, legal exposure. I don't know if that's true, but that's certainly openly discussed now that that could be a possibility. I think the greater possibility is that he's 
you know, pissed and he does his thing and he wants attention. He won't show up to the inauguration. No one should expect him to. He won't do that. It's he's President Trump. That's his thing. Um, and that it's, you know, it's a sort of whimper, not a bang. And that's why, again, the numbers matter, right? I mean, in other words, a, a decisive victory in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, a close call in Texas. You know, I don't think Biden's going to win Florida, but a, a close call in Texas um, or a Biden victory. I mean, th those are just, that is decisive. It's hard for him to do much because remember, his people around him will start to look at the exit doors as well. They'll say, you know, and, and a lot of the political people, the Republicans who, who, who remain silent are going to start, I mean, it sounds pathetic, but they will, are going to start gunning to, for 2024. Hello? Sue Mandel, did you want to go ahead yeah. and ask your question? Thanks. Yes. I, I love your optimism that it will be decided November 3rd. So I'm just going to keep that. You keep it. Thought, but I'm I'm curious. One, it, it it's it's internalized. But yeah. I'm just curious. Um, you know, we're all worried a little bit about the red mirage, where it looks like Trump is ahead because the absentee ballots haven't been counted, and yeah. the absentee ballots come in, and then and then of course, you know, in our dream and hope, it's Biden. But. Um, I'm curious what you think of maybe getting a few states, and maybe it's too late, it's most likely too late, but if we could get a few states to commit not to announce their results until they have all of them counted, and that way Trump cannot claim yeah. on election night. No, that's exactly right. So, so most of them have, and also remember the AP has committed not to do that. So we have a 150 year tradition. I've just learned about it in the last years. I, I have gotten educated on this, uh, that, uh, that uh, the news organizations and even Fox abides by it. We'll see if they behave on the third, uh, that the AP call is, leg is, is the legitimate call um, in terms of, uh, of, of um, where a state is. The states will not declare until it is, until essentially, the absentee ballots, um, uh, they'll do a, a conditional declaration. But um, uh, and well, can I just as say, I said, I'm taking it one step beyond that. It, it it's, they, it's when, when we watch it, typically it's, you know, 4% of yeah. you know, Wisconsin's in, then 8%, and they look and they say, based on this county, we're, but what I'm saying is for Wisconsin, we're not giving you results. No. Yeah, that one. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, you it, do if that. that yeah, it's gonna. Be, it would be hard to do this late in the game. It would have to come from the state itself. Some, some secretary of, you know, a, a consortium of secretaries of state saying that they will not certify those. But what you're, can you see me? I think you look. Well, yeah. But what you're seeing is at least like the state by state decisions about how they disclose what the um, uh, how you know every 4%, every 8%, it'd be hard to change by now. It's not a bad idea, um, but it does. Uh, uh, what, I, what I will say is there's a misunderstanding. Most of the states though, that have, um, um, have right in ballot, I'm sorry, drop off ballots, mail in ballots. So those are different in many states than absentee. Um, and um, mail-in ballots are right now, this is the question before you, the, the man and woman who's, who's, who's were separated. They're being what's called prepped right now. In other words, they're getting out of their envelope, they're checking the security features, they're making sure it's not counterfeited, they're checking the signature. Um, and all they need to do at 1201 on November 3rd is put those stacks through counting machines. So, so, um, so, and, and states that matter, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, are doing that. So it's not like they're just sitting there and then everyone has to open them up. These, one of the reasons why you're hearing about ballots being put aside is because the majority of them are already prepped. They're just gonna be counted at 1201. So it's gonna be quite a, quite a day. I mean, you can imagine in some states, they will have counted half of their votes before you wake up. Pretty incredible. That yeah, really is, that really is, yeah. Um, Lexi, Lexi Schmertz, one of our uh, other, other co-hosts, mm -hmm. please go ahead. Hi, Juliet. So I am curious, America First, uh, which is an alt-right group, has been yeah. 
posting some stickers you know, throughout Greenwich. It's been sort of a sticker gate. Um, and obviously it's been you know, really disturbing to see this in our backyard. Yeah. Um, and I will say also, I'm shocked that, that a group of, of white men can be so organized. But um, <laughs> having said that, <laughs> I am a bit curious, how do you combat a group, yeah. an organization that is anonymous and that acts literally under the cover of darkness? Right. So I mean, part of it is they're allowed, I mean, I hate to say it, but they're allowed to. It's one of the it's one of the hardest things I have to say on air is, you know, Trump supporters have First Amendment rights, too. I mean, they're not threatening. They're 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 allowed to be assholes. They're allowed to do you know, organize in ways that make us sick to our stomach. Um, and they're not allowed to use that to intimidate you from asserting your federal rights. So a sticker is unfortunately, you know, you may feel like I can't believe this is my community but that's not intimidating you from voting. So I'm a big fan and I've learned this the hard way because I used to engage it. And, you know, I'm just a big fan of um, ignore, you know, that the, the, the disinformation, the anger breeds on reaction and oxygen. I mean, in some ways, like I don't, I mean, I work for CNN, it has its problems, but I have to turn off MSNBC sometimes because I get, I get, you know, like, you know, they, they'll do a 20 minute story on a, state senator, you know, in the minority party in North Dakota, who says something crazy. And you're like, okay, I just like, I need to put that in for, I need to like not give that oxygen, right? In other words, so the, every, every network has its problems. Now I've bashed them all, but uh, they also do their good. But, you know, so part of it, is, I think it's the oxygen factor. Um, and um, I do think a lot of this goes away though. I think, I think Trump just gives them oxygen. Why are men like what you, who you're describing feel like they can walk around town and like this is, I mean, I'm all for shaming. I, I say, you know, it's a make America sh ashamed again. That's like, that's what I want. I want us to be ashamed that we were behave this way. That's right. Um, we have two more questions here. The first Great. one is from Kitty Douglas. Please, Kitty, are you still there? Yes, I am. Hi. Right. Wonderful. Hi, Juliet. Thank you so much. This has been incredible. I'm sorry I'm not on camera, but no, that's um, okay. I'm barely on camera. So I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> cooking, I'm cooking dinner. I'm I'm totally focused on what you're saying though. Um, I just want to ask you, I, I'm gonna go with your optimism and with the optimism yes. I'm hearing all week from very smart people who, you know, poll and, and know these things more than I do. If there is a Biden, let's say there's a Biden landslide. And we have to live through this transition that you're talking about. Yeah. Which we all have imagined. Tell us what a group like Big Tent could do yeah. to stabilize as much as possible during the transition. That is so fantastic. So first of all, and I, you know, I hate talking crudely, and I, I don't formally work for the Biden campaign. I'm obviously a supporter. I help them in you know, get out the vote efforts. I help in efforts like this that are not specifically aligned with the candidate. Um, so I can say there is actually, you know, if you are still raising and supporting efforts, there is a transition fund. Transitions are not necessarily fully paid for by a government. In other words, the Biden campaign is already raising. I think if you just type in, you know, Biden transition. So uh, additional resources matter because you can get people in. I did transition for Obama. You know, you've got really, you know, you qu uh, qualify. You, you've got subject matter experts who you want to help um, help them, right? In terms of what the transition is, I think, um, it, um, and so that just takes resources. Um, I think you should, uh, you know, what brought you together. I just, as I said, I did some research. Was actually substance. It wasn't just money and phone calls. It was. You know there are there are common beliefs we all have across the political spectrum. Let those be known either in writing or or there'll be mechanisms for briefing that you are a powerful enough group that you should be able to get an audience. Um, those how that happens will be disclosed over uh, probably by the fourth or fifth. But the the transition will you know no one talks about a transition formally until the third. It will emerge all of a sudden with people and names and processes. So, uh, you know, you, you, you know, you know, bringing dignity back to government, but you also, you have ideas around healthcare and fiscal policies and stuff. So you should feel very vocal um, about that. And then I think the third is, I mean, the biggest challenge I think that for the transition team is obviously gonna be a, let's just be honest here, like a angry, bitter president who will still be president. Um, uh, uh, and so, 
you need to, um, I think, as I said, not give it oxygen. I really, I think, and I think that's going to be the hardest thing for him because if those of you who've been, you know, who remember when Obama came in and, or maybe even when Trump came in, the, the, uh, on November 4th, if Biden wins decisively, he's the story. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, that is, um, that's key. I think I just lost you. So let me make sure I can get you again. Um, that isn't just important to remember that uh, not to give him oxygen. I just think he's going to be a big, you know, but, you know, the, one of the great things about the cynicism of DC is everyone's going to be looking for a job. So, I mean, it's really <laughs> disgusting, but, and everyone's going to be positioning for 2024. Yeah. Um, I saw in the chat room, I know there, there might be another question and, and I saw in the chat room, someone asked me about Miles Taylor, who yep. came out as anonymous. He's was the secretary of Homeland Security's uh, chief of staff. And what do I think about that? And I'm, I'm, um, uh, I was supposed to be on CNN tonight about it. They then canceled the story because I think it's CNN is a little bit freaked out too, because Miles is a, um, is a analyst for them. And I think lied on air uh, uh, um, about whether he was anonymous. Um, I'm of the school that uh, there probably should be an accounting of the Trump administration in particular on family separation specifically. Um, so I'm not like viewing Miles as a, as a hero, but I do think he has both anonymously and publicly stepped forward in ways that we would expect a bigger man than him. I mean, he was just a mere chief of staff, you know, and, you know, the New York Times is getting into trouble today for suggesting that he was a, you know, a, a, a senior government official. It's a question about whether a chief of staff qualifies as that. Um, uh, but he's done stuff that, that, that bigger men have not. So at least until November 6th, uh, you know, you don't look back, you only look forward. Uh, this is going to take, you know, the Lincoln Republicans, the independents, you know, the, the, the security moms, the hardcore progressive Democrats, who is going to take everyone. And then on November 4th, we do need an accounting of, um, of how systems like that so faltered so badly uh, to lead to some of these really egregious uh, policies. Absolutely. Absolutely. So our last question, um, Anne, Anne Sawyer, please um, go ahead, jump in. Terrific. Thank you so much. Well, these are very practical questions. Um, one is for those of us who are on the front lines on election day in town hall registering uh, new voters, um, not used to seeing or working around armed people. We yeah. it is an open state. Um, if, if we feel that privilege is being abused and is intimidating, um, what recourse do we have? And I'd also yeah. like to have a second selfish question as the mother of a daughter who. Uh, newly sworn in as um, a special agent with Homeland Security Investigation. Oh, congratulations. Hey, I'm very proud. Um, I just wonder what you think the future of the agency is and yeah. the uh, BU's election day and in the future. Thank you. Yeah. So um, okay, so the first one is, if you have not gotten a briefing from uh, the entity that has that you're a volunteer for, you should ask them. There should be protocols known to you. They may become known to you on Tuesday. Generally, what we're advising is you obviously take nothing into your own hands. You obviously don't confront people. Um, uh, you know, you know. I'm not sure how much you worry about that. Where are you in terms of open carry? Are you? Uh, it's it, Connecticut's an open carry state. Oh, right. That's, I, I always find that so shocking. Like you could tell yes, me that a hundred times I and I would forget that. that. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's, I think it's sufficiently not a part of the culture that you're probably not likely to see a lot of it. And so, I mean, what, what we would say is, you know, if law enforcement is not present, and you're going to see a much greater law enforcement presence, not necessarily bad, but simply because of issues like this, uh, that you would approach them. That's the only, that's the only thing you should do. Uh, not approach the person uh, not exacerbate it. Um, and I think you're going to be surprised at the law enforcement presence that is available, hopefully. Uh, but even to tomorrow, you know, whatever phone number you are using to be able to do your work, um, you should, uh, uh, you should call them and see what the security planning is. My biggest fear for you is you're going to be encountering lots of people. So make sure you, I mean, double mask, and you know, and wear gloves. That's what I'm. That's that's my biggest fear for you, because um, you'll be encountering 
voters are much safer than people who are working it. So just make sure you you you, you stay safe. Um, for the future of the department, I think um, you're going to see its orientation not be so immigration focused, which is great. It will probably align more with what states and localities want rather than going to war is what you saw in Portland with HSI. Um, uh, for others who don't know what her daughter is doing, the, the real job of the Homeland Security investigators is long-term counterterrorism, counterfeit, uh, money laundering, uh, uh, international crime cases. I mean, it's a huge asset. Uh, they got tarnished by their use in Seattle and Portland. Um, and so, um, uh, um, so just, it's a great thing. And I think, I think, uh, you'll see an alignment away from purely immigration. Um, so that's number one. And you will see a focus on COVID. I've just, you know, I'll end with this again. There's no other story. I mean, we're, we're, I moved on to the election for the next week. There is, but what, there is no other story. There's no other national security story, no other economic story, no other domestic story. Once we know who the president is, except for COVID. Uh, we got to we got to manage this and we are entering, you know, it's just horrible for us. Um, and so uh, so I'm hoping hoping a Department of Homeland Security, which has really not been involved with COVID to date, um, really does begin to support state and local efforts to just begin to get a man to manage this. Yeah, that's right. I always like to use the um, numbers 420, which yeah. Biden has used them. Four percent of the world's population, twenty percent of our, our cases, deaths. Yeah, uh, that's uh, uh, unacceptable for this country. Yeah, there's no other story. Yeah, right, that's right. Well, Juliet, thank you so much. Thank you. Follow me if you want to be calm. Follow me on Twitter because I'm going to try to keep everyone calm.